Section four of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section four. Phineas Pett continued. On the charge of insufficiency of material, however, the evidence is against Pett. There can be little doubt but that much of the timber was unsuitable. Some was green and unseasoned, some too old and in incipient decay while the curved timbers which should have been cut from trees crooked by natural growth had been cut from straight trees with the result that the grain did not run round but across the curves to the detriment of their strength in december sixteen twenty one the navy commissioners expressed their feelings on the subject to buckingham in a letter of which the following draft is preserved in the coke manuscript Quote, her weakness is so great that all we can do unto her at this time with above five hundred pounds charge will but make her ride afloat and be able to go to sea upon our own coast rather for show than for service and that to make her a strong and perfect ship will require at least six thousand pounds charge and time till monies and fit provisions may be had this we write to your honour with grief and some indignation seeing a ship which so lately cost his majesty near twenty thousand pounds and was boasted to be of force to fight for a kingdom so suddenly perish and that no other reasons are given thereof but her first building of old red and decaying timber and that fallen in the sap and her double planking with green and unseasoned stuff wherein the improvidence of the officers and unfaithfulness of the workmen cannot be excused such faults tending to the dishonouring and disarming of the state cannot with duty be either coloured or concealed End quote. perhaps this was stated a little too strongly for in sixteen twenty three after a refit costing under a thousand pounds she made the voyage to spain and back in safety nevertheless as pointed out by mr oppenheim she was never subjected to any serious work and in sixteen forty one she was entirely rebuilt at woolwich by peter pett at an estimated cost of sixteen thousand and nineteen pounds to which must be added two thousand one hundred and sixty pounds for launching and transporting her to chatham having been forced by the circumstances to take the matter into his own hand james seems to have conducted the inquiry with moderation and skill and if he had remained content with weighing the evidence and had not attempted to decide some of the technical points in dispute himself his decision might have received universal acceptance an inspection of the list of witnesses on either side shows that the weight of authority was against pett the seamen appearing against him were of much greater importance than those for him and with the exception of burrell who subsequently reported against the ship the same may be said of the shipwrights in considering the result of the inquiry we cannot do better than follow james's division into the three points of art sufficiency of materials and charge as regards art it is obvious that pett was treading the path of progress experimentally with his new design the criticisms indicate that he had introduced modifications into the methods followed by baker and the older shipwrights for example in the width of the floor and the shape of the bows while the subsequent fairing of the mould and the alterations to the futtocks show that he was uncertain where he was going and modified his plans during the building for the settlement of the much disputed point of the flat of the floor which seems to have been the determination of the actual point at which the lower sweep commenced obtained presumably by finding the geometrical centre of that sweep and dropping a perpendicular from it on to the floor james chose briggs who was an eminent mathematician and chaloner who notwithstanding that he was a court official was of some eminence as a scientist their verdict in favour of pett must therefore be accepted as final on the whole it seems that as regards art pett was in the right but as regards the second point material sufficient has been already said to show that his opponents were justified in their criticism as regards the third point charge i e costs 
facts show subsequently that the claim that the charge of the building of this ship should not exceed other ships that had been built in her majesty's times allowing proportion for proportion the garnishing not exceeding theirs was entirely unfounded for even allowing for the lavish decoration the cost of building was much greater proportionately than that of any of those ships the exuberance of the decoration may be seen from the entries in the declared accounts printed in the appendix which are of additional interest from the information they give as to constructive details it will be observed that these agree with such details as can be made out in the hampton court and hitchinbrook pictures the commission of inquiry of sixteen eighteen found the management of the navy in much the same state as it was in sixteen o eight with the same abuses still unremedied but although in its report it did not pillory pet as the earlier commission had done it seems by the reforms which it instituted to have made him very uncomfortable the actual shipbuilding was concentrated at deptford and phineas was employed at chatham in the work of improving and enlarging that yard william burrell who had been one of pett's chief supporters in the prince royal inquiry was made one of the commissioners and although he remained the chief shipbuilder of the east india company the whole of the new construction which amounted to two ships yearly for the next five years was placed in his hands all the ships being built under contracts made between burrell and the commissioners naturally this arrangement however efficient it might be from the national point of view did not coincide with pett's interests and in his usual hyperbolic style he describes burrell and norris the surveyor as his greatest enemies and attributes the necessary reforms of the commissioners to a plot to ruin himself the story of the expedition to algiers which was as much a diplomatic move in support of the elector palatine as an attempt to suppress the algerine pirates has been amply dealt with by historians but there remains something to be said about pett's connection with it and his financial troubles that arose from it it will be noted that he does not utter a word as to what happened between the time of his joining mansell's fleet at malaga in the mercury on the eighth of february and his return to the downs on the nineteenth of september this silence was no doubt intentional and arose from his unwillingness to put on record anything that might give offence to his friend mansell or to higher authorities part of the fleet was fitted out at the expense of the london merchants who entered into a contract with phineas for the construction of two pinnaces of one hundred and twenty and eighty tons respectively subsequently named the mercury and the spy it was the habit of the master shipwrights to exceed their instructions in building ships for the navy partly perhaps from a desire to do greater things than they were asked to do and to outrival their colleagues but largely because the greater the ship the greater the profit to themselves when pett attempted to play this trick upon the merchants increasing one pinnace from one hundred and twenty tons to three hundred and the other from eighty tons to two hundred upon some hopes of thanks and reward he got bitten badly for the merchants disdaining the precedence of the royal dockyards insisted upon holding to their contract and left pett to make the best of a bad bargain his appeal to the council for redress was referred to the committee of merchants who in their reply of the second of december sixteen twenty two pointed out that their chief desires and endeavours have been and ever shall be to do right unto all and as fast as money can be gotten in to give satisfaction where any just demands can be made unto us they added that at our last meeting captain pett sent his brother and son unto us with whom we have conferred and have agreed that captain pett shall bring in his account and if it appear that he hath not received as much or more than any way can be due unto him either for making the two pinnaces or his entertainment we will make present payment of the remainder as we have formerly offered before your lordships the matter drifted on until sixteen twenty four and two further remonstrances from the admiralty brought forth a reply from the merchants that were quote, sorry to observe your lordship's displeasure contained against us 
upon the suggestions of those whom nothing but their own demands can satisfy your lordships may please to be advertised that we contracted with him to build two pinnaces for twelve hundred and seventy pounds and have paid to his workmen and lent to himself divers great sums of money over and above our contract and his wages by reason whereof we conceive he is more indebted to us than his wages demanded amounts unto in a great sum of money and also we lent him two hundred pounds upon his own bond yet unsatisfied notwithstanding as formerly we have certified your lordships and sundry times offered to captain pett that we were ready to account with him that satisfaction might be given if aught were due to either party and we are still ready to perform the same yet because he rejects this motion and that we are desirous your lordships may be fully satisfied of our honest intentions and proceedings and may be no further troubled herein we are therefore emboldened to become suitors to your lordships that the commissioners of the navy or whom else your lordships shall please to appoint may have the examination of the account depending and if upon their report anything be found due we will take present order for payment thereof End quote. apparently pett never received the balance of the money but his troubles did not end there he was indebted to his brother peter for materials for these ships to the value of three hundred and twenty five pounds while his brother lived phineas does not seem to have troubled about repayment although according to elizabeth pett his sister-in-law peter had been often arrested on this account and phineas himself had as he tells us been arrested and imprisoned in sixteen twenty eight at the suit of one freeman by whom the timber seems to have been originally supplied after peter's death his widow endeavoured to recover the debt from phineas but could not enforce judgment on account of the latter's position as the king's servant she therefore petitioned the admiralty in january sixteen thirty three for leave to have the benefit of law against him pett was ordered to satisfy her or show cause why the law should not take its course pett explained his loss on the transaction and asserted that notwithstanding this great loss and main other befallen me yet according to my poor abilities i have endeavoured to make satisfaction for the debt due to my brother and he promised to pay it off in instalments elizabeth who had herself been taken in execution for the debt pressed for a larger amount down because she was almost utterly undone through want of the said sum so long time being the greater part of her maintenance in may phineas wrote to nicholas protesting that he could not help defaulting in his payments because his son fell dangerously sick and he could not get his arrears due from the exchequer and asserting his intention to settle the matter before the end of this term in june nicholas told him that the course of justice could not be stayed any longer and pett again promised that the instalment due should be paid in october pett was still in default and he was ordered by the admiralty to give immediate satisfaction or show cause within a week why proceedings should not be taken he managed still to hold out and on sunday the eighth of december he was arrested as he was going to st dunstan's church to hear a brother of his preach the officers let him go when they heard that he was the king's servant and subsequently excused their action on the ground that mrs pett's daughter had assured them that phineas lay skulking in obscure places and then lay at a chandler's shop in tower street being an old sea captain and ready to go to sea presently upon this pett petitioned the admiralty complaining that he had offered part of the debt which was utterly rejected and her implacable spirit will receive no other satisfaction but present payment of the whole debt and he asked the lords to summon mrs pett and her abettors before them for daring to arrest him without leave so that he can go about his business without fear of arrest and that she may be enforced to accept her debt at such reasonable times as he is able to pay the remainder of the story is not to be found in the state papers but pett tells us that the matter was fought out at law to his great charge so that presumably he was ultimately compelled to pay the money a little before the time when elizabeth first began to press him for the payment of the debt due to her late husband 
Phineas was being pursued by an anchor-smith named Tate, who asked the Admiralty for permission to proceed against him for a debt of £250, due on account of ironworks supplied for the construction of the Destiny, which Pett built for Sir Walter Raleigh in 1617. Phineas does not mention this in the manuscript, but as it gave rise to an interesting letter to Nicholas and a petition to the Admiralty printed in the appendix, it seems worthy of passing reference. On the return of Raleigh from his disastrous expedition, the destiny was confiscated by the Crown, her name being changed to Convertive. Pett was therefore unable to recover against the ship the seven hundred pounds which was due to him, and presumably had no power to recover it from Raleigh's estate. Possibly, however, this was another case in which he had exceeded the contract and had no legal remedy against the owner for the difference. In relating the voyage to Spain with the squadron sent to bring home Prince Charles after his foolish adventure with Buckingham at the Spanish court, Pett has not been so reticent as he was in the case of the voyage to Algiers, and he has given a fuller account of the incidents of the return voyage than will be found elsewhere. The circumstances in which he went mark the peculiarly favoured position which he held in relation to the King and the Lord High Admiral. The letter written to Buckingham printed in the appendix further illustrates this special relationship. His complaint therein that the cook-room of the Prince had been moved against his consent is evidently directed against the commissioners, who, in their report of 1618, had urged that cook-rooms should be placed in the foresail because when placed amidships the smoke made the oakum spew out and they took up valuable space required for storage and by bad distribution of weights made the ship apt to sway in the back it does not seem unreasonable that the navy commissioners should have objected to the absence of one of the principal master shipwrights from his duties for such a purpose as the voyage in question although phineas with his usual animus against those who differed from him accuses them of plots and malicious practices the scandal in regard to the sale of old cordage as brown paper stuff was judicially investigated before the judge of the admiralty and the report of the proceedings is preserved among the state papers from this report it appears that palmer pett and others had sold this material much of which so it was alleged might have been used for oakum gunwads or twice laid rope without the consent of the other principal officers some of the money received for it had been applied to legitimate purposes but it is clear that part had been kept back in the hope that no questions would be asked and that after a time the holders might appropriate it for themselves the assertion of pett that it was claimed as a perquisite to our places is not borne out by his own evidence According to his deposition made on the 7th of August, 1633, the keeper of the storehouse at Chatham had reported to him that the storehouse was so cumbered with unnecessary and unserviceable cordage and old ends and decayed junks that there was no room for serviceable material. For this reason, he and Turn, clerk of the survey, then acting as deputy to Aylesbury, sold a quantity of old ends and decayed junk for brown paper stuff but pett alleged that he told the master then attendant and other officers that nothing that was fit for use or service was to be handed over to the purchasers pett could not remember the total amount received for this stuff but stated that he had received of the said sir henry palmer upon promise made by this deponent to deliver up bills to the treasury of his majesty's navy for so much money due to him this deponent from his majesty four score and six pounds sterling and hath since made an assignment to the said treasurer to default so much out of this deponent's entertainment payable to him he further stated that the sales were by their own authority being principal officers of his majesty's navy and claimed that any two of the said principal officers personally attending at chatham have sufficient power and authority for themselves without acquainting the rest there being diverse precedents of the like done by others heretofore on the twenty second of february sixteen thirty four pett palmer fleming turn and lawrence were sequestered 
from their places for having sold the material without sufficient authority but on the first of march charles entirely pardoned pett while only allowing the others the favour of continuing in their places until they had answered in writing the idea of building a royal ship that should be larger and more ornate than any of her predecessors seems to have originated in the mind of the king who acquainted pett with his intention towards the end of june sixteen thirty four phineas thereupon prepared a model which was ready by the middle of october and was carried to court on the nineteenth of that month in the meantime the masters of trinity house heard the project and lodged the amusing protest printed in the appendix apparently this model was not approved for on the seventh of march of the following year pett received instructions from the admiralty to build a new great ship of fifteen hundred tons and was told to prepare a model for it this second model does not appear to have been constructed but as pennington's draft giving the dimensions proposed by him for the ship is endorsed by the king as a model perhaps a tabular statement of that nature was all that was intended in april a committee consisting of pennington mansell pett and john wells examined pett's plans and drew up the following schedule of proposed dimensions which was approved by the king but afterwards modified Quote, according to your majesty's command we have examined the particulars of the plot and the dimensions presented to your majesty by captain pett and by comparing the rules of art and experience together we have agreed to the proportion underwritten which we most humbly submit to your majesty's further pleasure length of the keel a hundred and twenty seven feet breadth within the plank forty six feet two inches depth in the hold from the breadth to the upper edge of the keel eighteen feet nine inches keel and dead rising two feet six inches draught of water from the breadth to the lower edge of the keel twenty one feet three inches the swimming line from the bottom of the keel eighteen feet nine inches the flat of the floor thirteen feet rake of the stern thirty eight feet rake of the post eight feet height of the tuck at the fashion piece sixteen feet breadth of the transom twenty eight feet height of the way forward fourteen feet distance of the ports ten feet ports upon the lower tier square two feet eight inches ports upon the second tier square two feet six inches ports upon the third tier round or square two feet four inches distance of the ports from the swimming line with four months victuals at four feet six inches with six months victuals at seven feet distance of the ports from the swimming line with four months victuals at five feet with six months victuals at four feet six inches the first deck from plank to plank seven feet the second deck seven feet three inches the third deck seven feet three inches all the decks flush fore and aft and the half deck quarter deck and foresail according to the plot one this ship by the depth in hold will be one thousand four hundred and sixty six ton and tonnage two by the draught in water one thousand six hundred and sixty one ton and tonnage three by the mean breadth which is the truest of all one thousand eight hundred and thirty six ton and tonnage your majesty will be pleased to be informed that after mature debate we have likewise agreed upon the rules to be proportioned to each sweep of the midship bend and where the bend is to be placed and likewise of the rules to be held in her narrowing and rising lines which we will pray may be only imparted to your majesty robert mansell j pennington j wells phineas pett End quote. this is endorsed in the king's handwriting quote, dimensions resolved on for the great ship seventh of april sixteen thirty five End quote. it is of interest to note as evidencing the jealous way in which the fundamentals of the design were kept secret that the committee proposed to impart the details of the midship bend and of the narrowing and rising lines which together formed the key to the actual form of the hull to the king alone ten days later pennington appears to have put in a proposal that slightly modified this design 
increasing the draught of water by nine inches, the beam by four inches, the flat of the floor by one foot, and the tonnage by fifty-six or forty-eight tons, but decreasing the keel length by one foot. His scheme of dimensions, which is endorsed in the King's handwriting as, quote, Dimensions of Pennington's model for the great ship, 17th of April, 1635, end quote, seems from the fact that the tonnage is quoted in the contemporary lists as 1,522 tons to have been the one finally adopted, though with slight modification. It runs as follows. Length of the keel, 126 feet. Breadth at the beam, 46 feet 6 inches. Breadth at the transom, 28 feet. Breadth at the floor, 14 feet. Breadth from the water, 2 feet. Draught of water, 19 feet 6 inches. Ports from the water, 5 feet. Ports asunder 9 feet some more, 2 feet. Ports from the deck, 7 feet 6 inches. Distance between the decks from plank to plank, 37 feet 6 inches rake of the stem nine feet rake of the post seventeen feet height of the tuck seventeen feet depth in hold from the ceiling to the lower edge of the beam seventeen feet sweep of the rung head eleven feet sweep at the right of the mould thirty one feet sweep between the water line and the breadth ten feet sweep above the breadth fourteen feet burden in tons and tonnage by the old rule one thousand five hundred and twenty two new rule one thousand eight hundred and eighty four the outstanding interest of this model lies in the fact that it is the only instance in which the sweeps of the mould are given before we can proceed to construct from it the midship section we are met with a difficulty that the depth from greatest breadth to keel is not given but in the first model this was equal to the draught, that is, 18 feet 9 inches, and since this was increased by 9 inches, we may fairly assume that the depth in Pennington's model would be about 19 feet 6 inches, and in fact we have this dimension given in a contemporary list as 19 feet 4 inches. If, taking this figure, we now attempt to plot this section, it will be found that the sweeps will not reconcile the radius of the futtock sweep, 31 feet being too great by about six feet the mistake appears to lie in the height of the breadth from the water that is the height of the greatest breadth above the swimming line given as two feet in the first model this was two feet six inches and as it is not probable that it would be less in the deeper ship we may take this to have been three feet and not two feet on this assumption we can proceed to construct the curve of the midship section as in the drawing annexed in this drawing we have a b equals the half breadth twenty three feet three inches a c equals the depth from greatest breadth to top of keel nineteen feet four inches a d equals the half flat of the floor seven feet d e equals the radius of the rung head sweep eleven feet F G equals the radius of the sweep between greatest breadth and the water line, ten feet. F H equals the radius of the sweep above the breadth, fourteen feet. We can now plot the curve of the section. Drawing the arc F I with radius G F to a depth of three feet perpendicularly below C F, we obtain the point I, and producing I G backwards to K, a point thirty one feet distant from I, we have the centre of the futtock sweep, or sweep at the right of the mould, which is given as 31 feet in radius. With this radius from K, we draw the arc IL, cutting a line, drawn from K through E at L. On drawing the rung head sweep from D, with radius of 11 feet from centre E, it is found that this arc meets the other precisely at L, and these two arcs reconcile i.e. are tangent to each other at L, for the centres of both arcs lie in the same straight line, K-E-L. The curve of the top sides presents more difficulty, because we are only given the radius of the sweep above the breadth, but if we assume that the distance C-M, or total height of the midship section above the greatest breadth, is equal to A-C, 
and this seems to have been the customary proportion and that the reverse curve n o was struck with the same radius as f n namely fourteen feet we get a curve for the half midship section a d l i f n o which cannot be far from the original design and in the lower portion must approximate to it very closely indeed there are no data from which the plan or elevation can be constructed but it may be noted that the list in the state papers already quoted gives the length of keel as one hundred and twenty seven feet although the tonnage remains as fixed by pennington so that presumably the rakes of the stem and stern posts were also modified so as not to increase the displacement or rather the empirical measurement of it some time during this year peter pett was petitioning the king for license to print and publish the plot or draft of the great ship a concession which he had apparently been promised but there is no record of the answer returned to his petition nor is there any trace of the drawing which may have been the original of the well-known engraving by payne in sixteen thirty three christopher pett gave pepys a copy of the plate of the sovereign with the table to it but whether this was peter pett's plot or payne's engraving with additional details cannot now be ascertained pett estimated the cost of building the ship at thirteen thousand eight hundred and sixty pounds and was to be required to put in assurance to finish her for sixteen thousand pounds but before she was complete wages alone had amounted to more than this sum while the total cost exclusive of ordnance reached the extraordinary amount of forty thousand eight hundred and thirty three pounds in may pett set out for the north to fell and prepare the two thousand five hundred trees required for her in chopwell and Brantspeth woods the cost of carriage of the timber to the water estimated at one thousand one hundred and ninety pounds at least fell upon the counties of durham and northumberland and bishop morton of durham who had been made responsible for the provision of this service had to apply to the council for assistance in proportioning out the assessment the county of northumberland objected to the burden to be placed upon it and it was suggested that cumberland westmoreland and the north riding of yorkshire should bear part by the beginning of september the timber had begun to arrive at woolwich and pett expected to have the ship finished in eighteen months on the nineteenth of september phineas found it necessary to protest to the king against the interference of the other officers who had from the beginning opposed the king's purpose in building this ship and especially against being made to take material of which he did not approve and against the attempt to charge the ship with the cost of houses then being built at woolwich he pointed out that he could not keep the cost within the estimate if such practices which seemed to have been customary were permitted the navy officers complained to the admiralty of pett's action and he was called before the admiralty when he denied that he had complained to the king about any of them possibly the great disproportion between the estimated and the ultimate cost of the ship was to some extent due to the fact that his protest was not successful though it is difficult to believe that his original estimate can have been even approximately accurate he had also underestimated by six months the time required to build her the manuscript ends abruptly with pett's visit to the lord high admiral on the first of october sixteen thirty eight and curiously enough the references to him in the state papers hitherto frequent cease at the same date with a letter from northumberland to pennington mentioning this visit except for one reference in connection with a gratuity to be given to henry goddard in april sixteen forty five his name is never again mentioned therein yet he remained in the service and carried on his duties at chatham until his death on the twenty eighth of june sixteen forty two the king sent him a warrant informing him of the appointment of pennington as lord high admiral in place of northumberland and directing him to send the standard and all necessaries for the fleet as sir john should direct it will be remembered that pennington hesitated and waited before going to the fleet with the result that warwick who had been nominated by parliament to take command went on board the flagship on the second of july and the fleet went over to the parliamentary side 
on the twentieth of august colonels sir john seaton and edwin sandys acting on instructions from the committee of public safety went to chatham dockyard which was surrendered to them by captain pett when he saw their warrant this was on saturday evening and on the monday they completed their work by placing a guard on board the sovereign pett was rewarded for his ready obedience by being included among the commissioners of the navy appointed by ordnance on the fifteenth of september and he was to receive the same allowance as he already held although the other captain except batten and john holland were only given a hundred pounds a year from this time until his death in august sixteen forty seven in his seventy-seventh year he seems to have remained quietly at chatham perhaps too old to take any very active part in current affairs for he has certainly left no mark upon them his death seems to have occurred unnoticed the exact date is unknown and there is no record of his will if he made one the last entry concerning him in the official records relates to the payment of his salary up to the twenty ninth september sixteen forty seven when he had passed away but no reference is made to that fact it is curious that sir henry vane the treasurer of the navy in sixteen forty seven who had corresponded with pett and must have known of his death has left a blank in place of his name in the entry in these accounts relating to the salary of thomas smith who succeeded to pett's post in chatham on the twenty eighth of august no authentic portrait of phineas is known to exist he tells us that in sixteen twelve his picture was begun to be drawn by a dutchman working then with mr rock one of the ship painters but does not say if it was ever finished the picture in the national portrait gallery which shows the stern view of the sovereign at one time supposed to be a portrait of phineas is now acknowledged to be that of his son peter another picture in the possession of the earl of yarborough has been exhibited in the past as a portrait of phineas but there can be no doubt that it really represents sir phineas son of peter of deptford and grandson of peter of wapping who was a commissioner of the navy from sixteen eighty five to sixteen eighty nine the ship included in this picture is probably the britannia built by sir phineas in sixteen eighty two in forming any just appreciation of the character and abilities of phineas pett regard must be had to the circumstances of age in which he lived it was a time of great political and religious unrest and expressions of religious devotion which might now be thought extravagant were then normal and were apparently not thought incongruous with dishonesty in money matters the chronic maladministration of the navy and the arrears in payment of the relatively small salaries allotted to responsible posts may to some extent justify methods of acquiring additional emoluments that nowadays are judged more severely pett's kindness towards his unfortunate brothers and sisters shows a good heart and there must have been something attractive in his character to secure him the steady support of nottingham james i and charles i which went so far as to shield him against the consequences of his misdeeds the favoured position which he held and the privilege he enjoyed of direct intercourse with the supreme heads of the navy behind the backs of his immediate superiors brought pett into conflict with the latter on many occasions it is not necessary to accept the explanation of phineas that these incidents were the result of conspiracies directed against him to oppose him was a deadly sin thus burrell who was a worthy gentleman and good friend when he stood on pett's side in the prince royal inquiry became pett's greatest enemy engaged in the malicious practice of tending to overthrow me and root my name out of the earth because he was appointed one of the commissioners of inquiry in sixteen eighteen pett was evidently interested in the various efforts made in the early seventeenth century to explore and colonize the coasts of north america he frequently refers to his friendship with button and states that he assisted in the selection of the resolution for the voyage of sixteen twelve he was moreover a kinsman of hawkridge and an acquaintance of fox while gibbons was the master of his ship the resistance the disparaging remark on weymouth's mistaking his course as he did in the northwest passage 
shows that he was acquainted with the story of the voyage of 1602, but the most competent modern authorities do not agree with this opinion of Pett, and of his contemporary Fox, and hold that Weymouth did in fact enter the straits subsequently called after Hudson, and sail along them for a considerable distance. Pett was also a member of the Virginia Company, though he does not mention this fact. His name appears in the second and third charters of the company, 1609 and 1612, and in 1611 he subscribed the sum of thirty-seven pounds and ten shillings. This was the lowest subscription allowable for members, but it was a comparatively large sum for those days. Evidently, Phineas, in spite of his large and growing family, was at this time fairly prosperous and had an income considerably greater than the fifty four pounds fifteen shillings which represented his official salary and allowance no doubt this income was augmented by the trading ventures in the resistance and by shipbuilding for private owners and by various official perquisites in sixteen fourteen it was increased by forty pounds granted him by the king under writ of privy seal but in 1617 and the following years his bad speculations in regard to the destiny the pinnace built for lord souch the mercury and the spy made serious inroads into his capital and burdened him with a load of debt which seems to have weighed upon him for many years and given him much trouble james came to his assistance in 1620 by presenting him with a patent for a baronetcy which brought him about 650 pounds and charles gave him another in sixteen twenty eight which only fetched two hundred pounds his appointment as a commissioner of the navy in sixteen thirty one increased his official income to two hundred pounds exclusive of the forty pounds payable on the writ of privy seal with this substantial addition to his salary he was in a position to gradually improve his finances and after sixteen thirty four we hear no more of the actions for debt from the story of his life as now unfolded it is clear that phineas pett was a man of considerable ability and industry kindly to his friends but impetuous and quick-tempered well in with the authorities and apt to take advantage of that fact when he disagreed with his equals or superiors it is probable that he was slightly in advance of his contemporaries in the profession of shipbuilding but not to the extent commonly supposed here his autobiography has stood him in good stead for it has attached to his name a personality that makes his existence seem more real and of more moment to a later age in which his professional contemporaries have become shadowy names it is difficult to say what was his real motive in writing it but it was probably commenced as an explanation of his position in regard to the prince royal dispute of sixteen o eight and afterwards continued partly for recreation partly perhaps for the edification of his children pepys appears to have thought much of it for he took the trouble to copy it into his collection of miscellanea but it is certainly wanting in the candour and honesty of the celebrated diary and seems to have been written in order to convey a favourable impression to the reader and explain away doubtful deeds rather than as a real revelation of self End of section four. Section five of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five. Autobiography of Phineas Pett, part one. I, Phineas Pett, being the son of Mr. Peter Pett at Deptford Strond in the county of kent one of her majesty's master shipwrights was born in my father's dwelling-house in the same town one all saints day in the morning being the first day of november in the year of our lord fifteen seventy and was baptized the eighth of the same month and year aforesaid in the parish church of deptford strond aforesaid i was brought up in my father's house at deptford strond until i was almost nine years of age and then put out to a free school at rochester in kent to one mr webb with whom i boarded about one year and afterward lay at chatham hill in my father's lodging in the queen's house from whence i went every day to school to rochester and came home at night for three years space 
afterwards by reason of my small profiting at this school my father removed me from thence to greenwich to a private school kept by one mr adams where i so well profited that in three years i was made fit for cambridge in the year fifteen eighty six at shrovetide against bachelor's commencement i was sent to the university of cambridge and by the means of one mr howell a minister in essex i was placed in emmanuel college with a reverend tutor president of the house called mr charles chadwick where i was allowed twenty pounds per annum during my father's life besides books apparel and other necessaries in the year fifteen eighty nine about the sixth day of september it pleased god to call to his mercy my reverend loving father whose loss proved afterward my utter undoing almost had not god been more merciful unto me for leaving all things to my mother's directions her fatal matching with a most wicked husband one mr thomas nunn a minister brought a general ruin both to herself and whole family some two months after my father's decease or thereabouts my eldest sister rachel was married to one mr newman minister of canudon in essex a man of most dissolute life with whom she not long enjoyed for god of his great mercy took her and delivered her from a most miserable and slavish life wherein she lived with him by whom he had two children but both died by reason of my mother's cross-matching my means of maintenance being wholly taken from me and having no hopes of exhibition from any friend i was forced after four years of continuance in cambridge my graces for bachelor of art being passed both in house and town to abandon the university presently after christmas in anno fifteen ninety at candlemas after i by the instant persuasion of my mother was contented to put myself to be an apprentice to become a shipwright my father's profession and was bound a covenant servant to one mr richard chapman of deptford strand in kent one of her majesty's master shipwrights and one whom my father had bred of a child to that profession my allowance from him to find myself tools and apparel being bare but forty six shillings and eight pence per annum this man i served almost two years altogether at chatham in the queen's majesty's works and then he died where i spent all that time god he knoweth to very little purpose after my foresaid master his death i laboured to have served mr matthew baker one of her majesty's master shipwrights also but by the working of one mr peter buck then clerk of the check at chatham and some other back friends i was crossed in my service and so put to my shifts and left to the wide world without either comfort or friend but only god at this time my eldest brother by my father's side mr joseph pett succeeded in my father's place one of her majesty's master shipwrights which preferment no doubt god brought him to the better enable him to have given his help to us but we found it clean contrary for he was not only careless of us all and left us to our fortunes but became also so unkind a brother to two of us my own brother noah and myself that he was forced to leave his native country and seek comfort in ireland with an uncle of ours own brother to my mother called george thornton an ancient and well experienced sea captain where he shortly after was drowned in the river of cork and myself was constrained to ship myself to sea upon a desperate voyage in a man-of-war not greatly caring what became of me i was shipped on this voyage a little before christmas in anno fifteen ninety two in a ship called the galleon constance of london a burden of two hundred tons or thereabouts belonging to a gentleman of suffolk one captain edward glenham for the carpenter's mate the master carpenter being one edward goodale born in deptford to my setting out to sea i found not any of my kindred so kind as to help me either with money or clothes or any other comfort only another brother i had by my father's side peter pett dwelling then at wapping that vouchsafed me lodging and meat and drink till the ship was ready to set sail 
one william king a yeoman in essex and a stranger to me lent me three pounds in ready money to help to furnish my necessaries which afterward i repaid him again in this voyage i endured much misery for want of victuals and apparel and after twenty months spent in the levant seas coasts of barbary and spain with many hazards both of loss of life and time without taking any purchase of any value we extreme poorly returned for ireland into the river of cork and there taking leave both of ship and voyage i travelled to dublin to visit my uncle captain thornton and my brother noah being then master with him in the popinjay of the queen's majesties and presently after bent my course for england taking passage at the town of waterford with some difficulty i got to london some three days before christmas in anno fifteen ninety four having neither money nor apparel and took up my lodging at my brother peter's house in wapping before spoken of who although i was returned very poor yet vouchsafed me kind entertainment the next day i presented myself to my brother joseph who very coyly receiving me out of his bounty lent me forty shillings to apparel myself which i bestowed as frugally as i could in birchin lane in london contenting myself as well as i could with mean attire till such time as it should please god to provide better for me at that time it so fell out that there were certain of her majesty's ships appointed to be made ready for the voyage of sir francis drake and sir john hawkins amongst which the defiance was to be brought into woolwich dock to be sheathed which work being commended to my brother joseph's charge he was contented to admit me amongst many others to be one where i was contented to make any pains to get something to apparel myself which by god's blessing i performed before easter next after and that in very good fashion always endeavouring to keep company with men of good rank far better than myself in the latter end of this year fifteen ninety four about the beginning of lent i lost my dear brother noah who was drowned in cork river with eight more of his company and lieth buried in cork church in ireland about bartholomew tide in anno fifteen ninety five the triumph of her majesty's was had into woolwich dock to be new builded by mr matthew baker under whom i was entertained there as an ordinary workman and had allowed me a boy which was john wood being the first servant that i ever kept but presently after mr baker was appointed to leave that business and had order to go in hand with the building of a great new ship at deptford called afterward the repulse and was admiral of my lords of essex squadron in the cadiz journey the triumph was then appointed to my brother joseph's charge with whom i a while continued but finding him altogether unwilling to prefer me in his work as next under him with some passage of discontent betwixt us i left him and had ready entertainment by mr baker in his new business at deptford yet no otherwise than an ordinary workman with whom i continued from the beginning of the aforesaid ship till she was wholly finished launched and set sail on her voyage from woolwich which was about the latter end of april fifteen ninety six all that winter in the evenings commonly i spent my time to good purpose as in ciphering drawing and practising to attain the knowledge of my profession and i then found mr baker some time forward to give me instructions from whose help i must acknowledge i received my greatest lights at this time also the lord admiral lay most of the winter at his house at deptford by reason whereof i got some acquaintance amongst his men and was much importuned to have attended his lordship in that journey which no doubt might have proved very much both profitable and beneficial unto me besides it would have brought me in acquaintance and favour with my lord admiral but some other reasons restrained me from all these likelihoods and kept me at home to my no small hindrance as it fell out after i was discharged from the repulse my brother joseph entertained me at woolwich upon the triumph upon which ship i wrought till her launching and the discharge of the men from her and afterwards was employed at my brother's at limehouse upon a small model for the lord treasurer his house called theobald's 
and the next winter I spent in Essex, at Pagelsham, in Rochford Hundred, an overseer for my brother Peter in certain woods he had bought there. About this time was I very desirous, by the instigation of some special friends of mine, to have been a follower of the Lords of Essex, and was three several times brought purposely to have been presented unto his lordship, but was every time delayed by reason of his great state affairs, the Lord of Heaven having other ways in his secret wisdom determined to dispose of me. In the latter end of March succeeding, or beginning of April, 1597, by the means of one Mr. Gilbert Wood, one of the Lord Admiral's chamber, an especial good friend of mine, I was presented to the Lord High Admiral of England, at his manor at Chelsea, where his lordship was pleased not only to accept me as his servant, but also openly showed such extraordinary respect of me, as I had much cause to give God thanks, who no doubt had stirred his honourable heart to regard me, but a simple and mean fellow, even far beyond my expectation or desert, and this was the very first beginning of my rising. In the beginning of this year, 1597, my dear and loving mother deceased at Weston in Suffolk, not far from Bury, and lieth buried in the parish church there. A little after midsummer in the same year, I was employed by my brother Joseph Pett in his yard at Limehouse, upon the repairing of a great Flemish ship of whom his master, Mr. John King of Limehouse, where I first came acquainted with him, and in his company, and Mr. Nicholas Simonson of Limehouse, I was first brought acquainted at Highwood Hill, where I first fell in love with my now wife, which was about St. James's Tide. About Bartholomew Tide, next following, the Elizabeth Jonas was brought into Her Majesty's dock at Woolwich, and there was the first preferment my brother Joseph helped me with making me principal overseer of that business under him. During all the time of this work, we both lodged and dieted at old Mr. Lydiard's in the yard. During the continuance of this work, I did not neglect my wooing, having taken such a liking of the maiden that I determined resolutely, by God's help, either to match with her or never to marry any, the which I with much difficulty, praised be God, at length achieved, all my own kindred being much against my matching with her, by reason of some controversies grown between Mr. Nicholas Simonson and them. Toward the end of February in this present year, I took the lease of a new house of Mr. William Borough, then controller of Her Majesty's Navy, at Limehouse by the Throughhead, which to some charge I fitted for my dwelling, although I remained not in it little more than two years, paying eleven pounds yearly rent and twenty pounds income i was married to my now wife anne the daughter of richard nichols of highwood hill in the parish of hendon in middlesex a man of good report and honest stock the fifteenth day of may fifteen ninety eight at stepney church upon a monday in the forenoon i kept my wedding at my own charge in my new dwelling-house at limehouse accompanied with my brothers and sisters, my wife's parents, and diverse of her friends and kindred. About midsummer after was the Elizabeth Jonas launched out of Woolwich Dock, and sudden preparation made to have received Her Majesty aboard the ship riding afloat. But upon some unknown reasons Her Majesty came not at all, for even at that instant had one Mr. Wiggs procured commission about examination of certain abuses in the Navy, which was pursued with a great deal of malice against diverse particular men, but with little profit to Her Majesty's service. From midsummer all the ensuing year, till Christmas, I lay still and idle, without any manner employment or comings in, but what my servants got with working now and then abroad, which was very little and hardly able to buy me food. About Christmas, my honourable lord and master, the Lord High Admiral, commended me to an employment in Suffolk and Norfolk for the finishing of a purveyance of timber and plank formerly undertaken by one child of soul, who dealt in Norfolk, and, dying, left the business in much disorder. And one Robert Ungle, who dealt in Suffolk, and, for diverse abuses by him there committed, fled the country and left all the service in great disorder and spoil 
for the rectifying of which abuses saving of her majesty's provisions and discharging of the countries it pleased my lord to make choice of me to undertake the same and to take order to send in all the said provisions of timber and plank which accordingly i did using all care and diligence in the performance of the same both to the content of her majesty's service my lord admiral and the officers of the navy and the satisfaction of all countries where i had to do notwithstanding through the malicious envy of old matthew baker bright addy and others all my doings and accounts were thoroughly sifted but thanks be to god nothing could be proved against me so that i had all my bills passed quietly but by reason of mr falk greville being then treasurer of the navy did not greatly affect me by cause of some particular spleens between him and mr john trevor then newly made surveyor who was my especial and worshipful friend he laid a rub in my way cutting me off wrongfully of twenty pounds in my account after all my bills were passed and signed by the hands of the principal officers according to the custom of the navy all this year of fifteen ninety nine i spent wholly in this service in which time these occurrences happened after the decease of my dear and loving mother there were left under the keeping of my father-in-law thomas nunn then minister of weston in suffolk three sisters vide abigail pett elizabeth and mary the youngest and one brother named peter pett who was put out to a gentleman's house in suffolk to teach his children the daughters remaining all at home with him he being then lately again married he used himself to them as a stern and cruel father-in-law not contented that he had brought a general ruin upon my mother's whole family by cozening us of all that was left us but proceeded further even to blood for upon a slight occasion about making clean his cloak being wet and dirty with riding a journey the day before he furiously fell upon my eldest sister abigail beating her so cruelly with a pair of tongs and a great firebrand that she died within three days upon that beating and was privately by his means buried but that god would not let murder pass unrevenged stirred up the hearts of his own parishioners and neighbours who complaining to the justice caused the body to be taken up and so by the coroner's inquest that passed upon her and miraculous tokens of the dead corpse as fresh bleeding sensible opening of one of her eyes and other things he was found guilty of her death and so committed and bound over to answer the matter at next general assizes to be held at bury which was in the lent after being in this year fifteen ninety nine and in the time of my employment in suffolk and norfolk upon his committing my two other poor sisters were put by the justices to the keeping of the town of weston till the assizes were passed at whose hands i received them at bury in a miserable fashion not having clothes nor any necessaries fit for them the charge of their board i was glad to defray to the constable and all the charge of the assizes where both they and my young brother were bound to give in evidence against our father-in-law to whom we showed more mercy than he did to us whom our spoil would not content but he thirsted also our blood in his arraignment sir john popham then lord chief justice of england and chief judge of that circuit showed such true justice notwithstanding great means was made for him not only by his friends but by the clergy of that country that all his cruelty and wicked proceedings was laid open and he convict of manslaughter by the jury was committed to prison to sue for the benefit of the queen's pardon from whence being shortly freed he by god's just revenging hand lived but a short time after from the assizes at bury i sent my brother and my two sisters home to my wife at limehouse being no small charge to me being but newly married and having little means but my hands to bring in anything yet i refuse not to do the duty of a brother to them to the utmost of my power the eldest of my sisters called elizabeth by means of friends i placed in london with a gentlewoman of good fashion where she continued not long but came home sick and died at my house as we doubted of the plague 
My youngest sister sickened also shortly after, but it proved the smallpox. In all these extremities I had little help from my brothers, who were bound in conscience to have had some care of them, the small portions they had being in the hands of my eldest brother Joseph. Yet no relief came from him towards their maintenance or bringing up. But being but half-brothers and sisters, they thought them less bound to do them good, and therefore left all the burden upon me, worst able of all to bear it. My youngest sister Mary, recovering her sickness, continued with me in my house, contenting herself with such breeding as I could give her, from whence she never removed till she was married from me. My young brother Peter, about the end of November, I placed with a worshipful gentleman, Dr. Hone, in the arches, as one of his clerks, where he might have lived well if he would have stayed with him. In December this year, 1599, I began a small model, which being perfected and very exquisitely set out and rigged, I presented it to my good friend, Mr. John Trevor, who very kindly accepted the same of me. In the beginning of this year, I, having no employment, determined with myself to have bought some part of a castle carvel, and to have gone in her myself, whereby I hoped, by God's blessing, to have gotten an honest and convenient maintenance, and to that end I began to follow one John Goodwin of London, professor of the mathematics, with whom I spent three days in a week, in practice. And so was purposed to have continued the whole year, till the spring following. But God, who in his secret counsel had otherwise decreed of me, altered all my determinations, for upon the twenty-fifth day of June I was sent for to the court, lying then at Greenwich, by my honourable lord and master, the lord high admiral, who, after some speeches expressing both his love and honourable care of me, his lordship concluded to send me down to Chatham, where I was to succeed in the place of one John Holding, a shipwright, that was keeper of the plank-yard timber and other provisions, upon some displeasure turned out of all. The means whereof being but small, as eighteen pence per diem, and six pounds per annum fee for myself, and allowance for one servant at sixteen pence per diem. I was very unwilling to undertake so mean a place, by the which I was neither sure of competent maintenance, nor of any reputation, but that I was encouraged by the persuasions of my ever-honourable lord, who comforted me with promises of better preferment to the utmost of his power, whereupon I being contented to accept his lordship's offer, I was, the twenty-seventh of the same month of June, placed at Chatham by Sir Henry Palmer, then controller, Mr. John Trevor, surveyor, and Mr. Peter Buck, clerk of the ships. At this time there was grown very high terms of unkindness between my brother Joseph and me about my poor sisters and brother, because he did not only deny to be any ways contributory to their maintenance, but also made the neighbours believe that they were brought up at his charge in my house, because he would not be troubled with them, when, God knoweth, he never dispersed halfpenny to their bringing up, nor cared what became of them. Now upon this occasion of my placing at Chatham, we were reconciled, and ever after lived together as loving brethren. It also happened that Sir Falk Greville, then treasurer, continuing his spleen against me for Mr. Trevor's sake, opposed me all he could, which, after, turned me to much trouble. About the time of my coming to Chatham, Mr. Barker, the lord of the manor, was removed to a house he had bought at Bowley Hill, by Rochester, by reason whereof his banner house wherein he formerly dwelt at Chatham was void, the which house by means of my brother Joseph's encouragement I ventured upon and took a lease for twenty-one years, paying twenty-five pounds income the which lease was sealed unto me the seventeenth day of october sixteen hundred the sixteenth day of june in this year my youngest brother peter having against all the consent of his friends and without their knowledge forsaken his worshipful master dr hone's service and betaken himself to disordered courses sickened at london at the sign of the dolphin in water lane and the twenty-first day after deceased of the smallpox before i knew he was sick whose charge both of his sickness and funeral i was at 
and saw him seemly interred accompanied with a good company of my friends in barking churchyard in tower street the twenty-third of the same month of june sixteen hundred the twenty-fourth of october having bestowed all my poor stock upon the lease of my house and the furnishing of the same in some convenient manner i shipped the same in an hoy of raynham and so moved to chatham myself going down in the hoy where i missed a great danger for at the west end of the nore about three of the clock in the morning twenty-fifth day we were like to be surprised by a picking dunkirk full of men who being at our passing by although it was very dark at an anchor suddenly weighed and gave us chase and had boarded us had not god prevented him by our bearing up the wind being at east and running ourselves on shore within the swatch the next day we got safe as high as gillingham my dwelling-house at limehouse i passed away with a great deal of loss both of income rent and wainscoting to the value of fifty pounds putting it over at ten pounds per annum when i was bound by lease to pay eleven pounds yet i was glad to be rid of it upon any condition presently after christide my wife being great with child fell sick at chatham and grew so weak that i was forced about the tenth of march following to remove her not without great hazard to london and from there to her father's house at highwood hill in middlesex where the twenty-third day of march after thanks be given to god she was delivered of her first-born son john pett from whence she returned to chatham in safety some two months after much about this time i was made an assistant to the master shipwrights at chatham in the room of thomas bodman in this year the first business i undertook was the repairing of the lion's whelp hauled up at the storehouse end at chatham in the year sixteen o two i also new built the moon hauled up in the same place enlarging her both in length and breadth and this year also i with mr Pickersey, undertook the victualling of the shipwrights and caulkers at chatham which we continued only two months to our great loss which we could never get recompense by reason mr fulk greville continued my heavy enemy and was content to receive and countenance informations against me because he could not win me to such conditions as he laboured me in both against my good friend sir john trevor who then lay very dangerously sick at plymouth and against many others serving with me at chatham the principal informer and stirrer in this business against me was one george collins sometimes carpenter of the foresight a very stubborn and malicious fellow who by mr greville's countenance was suffered to sue me at the common law upon an action of trespass for striking him with a little rod upon the shoulder in the queen's yard at chatham upon a cause of mutiny in the time of victualling and so little relief had i against him notwithstanding my lord admiral's favour that i was forced to compound with him and gave him twenty nobles ready money for satisfaction thus it pleased god to exercise me with continual trouble and hindrances in the beginning of my service in november this present year sixteen o two mr greville having undertaken the preparation of a fleet with her majesty to be ready fitted to sea by a set time was contented upon my promise to him to procure the said fleet to be fitted in six weeks to receive me to his favour which promise i accordingly by god's gracious assistance fully accomplished by which means i had gained his love favour and good opinion had there not happened a sudden alteration by the death of her majesty which presently followed the eighteenth day of march sixteen o three my wife was delivered of her second son henry at my house at chatham the twenty-fourth day of the same month her majesty of sacred memory deceased at richmond the same day his majesty whom god grant long to reign was proclaimed at westminster london and other places and the next day being friday and market day at rochester this year happened the great plague throughout england but especially about london by reason whereof many removed from thence into diverse places in the country where they had any friends or means of succour in the middle of july my brother joseph with his wife and children 
removed from his house at Limehouse to Ipswich. To transport them thither by sea, I procured a small pinnace of his majesty's to be prepared ready, called the Primrose, and manning her with my good friends and neighbours as Boson Vale, David Duck, Mr. Rock, Robert Perring, Jarvis Minns, and diverse others, together with myself, we embarked at Chatham the 14th of July, 1603, and in Tilbury Hope took in our passengers, and the 16th day in the afternoon landed them safely at Ipswich, where of the friends we received very great entertainment, staying there about four days, and the 21st day we arrived again at Chatham, thanks be to God, in health, about four of the clock in the afternoon. The sickness beginning to be very hot at chatham upon the persuasions of some of my friends i removed my wife and children from thence to my wife's father's in middlesex shipping them away in the same vessel i had to ipswich and landing at dagenham in essex had horses there met us and so journeyed to highwood hill this voyage was taken from chatham the sixteenth of august we came to highwood hill the nineteenth day where my wife and children remained till the third of october following which day we took our journey to Dagenham, where the next day we were stayed by a great rain. But the fourth day we came over the ferry at Greenhithe and safely home, thanks be given to God, at four of the clock that afternoon. This summer I began to new build the answer, being hauled up and blocked at the end of the storehouse at Chatham. The 10th of November my landlord, Mr. Barker, with some of his family, sojourned with me at Chatham, where they remained till the twenty-eighth day of the same month, and then returned to their own house at Bowley Hill. During this time I divers times solicited my brother to be joined patentee with him, but his remissness caused me to overslip opportunity so long that one Mr. Stevens of Limehouse, this year by means of some great friends about my Lord Admiral, got a general reversion of all the Master Shipwright's places, cutting me off from all hopes of any timely preferment, to my great discouragement, considering what pains I took at Chatham to further his majesty's service. When I was most dejected with the conceit of this injury, as I took it, it pleased God of his great mercy to me. Even then, when I least expected any such thing, to raise me up a means of some hope of preferment after this manner. For about the 15th of January, being at Ratcliffe with my wife, to christen her sister Simonson's daughter Martha, there was, unknown to me, a letter sent post to Chatham from my honourable Lord Admiral, commanding me with all possible speed to build a little vessel for the young Prince Henry, to disport himself in, above London Bridge, and to acquaint his grace with shipping and the manner of that element, setting me down the proportions and the manner of her garnishing, which was to be like the work of the Ark Royal, battlement-wise. This little ship was in length by the keel twenty-five foot and twelve foot in breadth, garnished with painting and carving both within board and without very curiously, according to his lordship's directions. I laid her keel the nineteenth day of January, wrought upon her as well day as all night by torch and candle-lights, under a great awning made with sails for that purpose. The sixth day of March after, I launched the ship, being on a Tuesday, with a noise of trumpets, drums, and such like ceremonies, at such time used. I set sail with her on the Friday after, being the ninth day, from Chatham. Between the Nore Head and the east end of Tilbury, we had a very great storm, so that it was Sunday before we could get to Gravesend. And on Monday morning, being the twelfth day, we anchored at Blackwall. Mr. George Wilson, then boatswain of the Lion, was master with me and myself captain and i was manned with almost all boatswains of the navy and other choice men on wednesday being the fourteenth day of march by my lord admiral's commandment we weighed from limehouse and anchored right against the tower before the king's lodgings his majesty then lying there before his riding through london there the young prince accompanied with the lord admiral and divers of the lords came and took great pleasure in beholding of the ship being furnished at all points with ensigns and pendants the sixteenth day being friday 
we unrigged and shot the bridge and the seventeenth day we rigged again and received both ordnance and powder from the tower on sunday in the afternoon being the eighteenth day fitted with a noise of trumpets and drums and fife we weighed and turned up with the wind at south-west as high as lambeth with multitudes of boats and people attending upon us as we passed by whitehall i saluted the court with a volley of small shot and our great ordnance and upon the ebb turning down again we did the like and then taking in our sails we came to an anchor right against the privy stairs on monday the nineteenth day his majesty went by barge to the parliament we shot our great and small ordnance of round both at his taking barge and landing all tuesday and wednesday we rode still without doing anything but giving entertainment to gentlemen of the king's and prince's servants that hourly came aboard of us on thursday morning being the twenty-second day i received a commandment from the lord admiral to prepare the ship and all things fitting to receive the young prince aboard of us in the afternoon who accordingly presently after dinner came aboard us in his barge accompanied with the lord high admiral earl of worcester and divers other noblemen we presently weighed and fell down as far as paul's wharf under both our topsails and foresail and there came to an anchor and then his grace according to the manner in such cases used with a great bowl of wine christened the ship and called her by the name of the disdain his grace then withdrawing himself with the lords into the great cabin there my honourable lord and till then master with his own hands presented me to his grace using many favourable words beyond my deserts in my commendations with this addition that i was a servant worthy of acceptance of the greatest prince of the world from his hands it pleased his grace very thankfully to receive me as his servant with many promises of his princely favour to me the next day being friday and the twenty-third of march it pleased my lord admiral to entreat my worthy friend sir john trevor to accompany me to the lord thomas howard then lord chamberlain from whom receiving a ticket i was sent to st james's the prince's house where by mr alexander and mr abington then gentlemen ushers i was sworn his grace's servant and by them presented to the prince before he went to dinner with as much favour and respect as i could desire during this time of my attendance at the court as his grace's captain of his ship it pleased my honourable lord admiral to give order to sir thomas windybank one of the clerks of the signet to draw me a bill for the reversion of mr baker's or my brother joseph pett's place which first should happen to be void notwithstanding the letters patent formerly granted to mr stevens which accordingly was with all expedition performed and the eleventh of april following was presented to his majesty and signed and shortly after passed the great seal for the whole charge whereof i gave sir thomas windybank seventeen pounds about the same time sir robert mansell had his patent passed for the treasury of his majesty's navy the third of may after my return to chatham from my attendance at court i began to set up a small ship at gillingham in david duck's yard at my own charges and the seventeenth day of the same month also was launched the answer whom i had new built who by carelessness ran off before her time without any great hurt thanks be to god therefore about the midst of june following the preparation was begun for the entertainment of his majesty aboard the ships at chatham where i took both extraordinary care and pains which my envious enemies mr baker and mr bright sought by all means to disgrace even at the instant time when his majesty was to come on board the elizabeth but the lord diverted all their malice by the countenance of my old master the lord admiral who approving my honest endeavours and finding the success answerable in all respects to his lordship's expectation dismissed them with sharp rebukes and encouraged me with no small commendation this happened the fourth of july sixteen o four the twelfth of november after i launched the new ship at gillingham which was begun in may preceding and called her name the resistance and in the beginning of december following i carried her up to limehouse and there hauled her on shore 
at the south side of my brother joseph's wharf where she lay till i had sold away part of her the twenty first of january following i sold one third part of her to sir robert mansell and another third to sir john trevor and the other third i reserved to myself i rigged her and prepared her with all her furniture to attend the lord high admiral of england in his journey into spain when he went ambassador and made ready the bear and the rest of his majesty's ships at chatham that went that voyage myself being commanded by his lord to wait upon him in his own ship the bear which accordingly i performed the twenty fourth of march i took my leave of the most noble prince my master at greenwich being sunday in the afternoon and the twenty-eighth day of the same month following i took leave of my wife and children at chatham and attended the lord ambassador on board the bear in his own barge the whole fleet then riding at queenborough from whence we set sail the last day being sunday and easter day the fourth day of april we came to an anchor in dover road and the tenth day after we lost the sight of the lizard the next day being the eleventh the lord ambassador sent me aboard my own ship the resistance with one captain morgan with certain directions to the groin but by the overbearing of captain morgan his lordship altering his determination came into the groin two days before us where we also arrived the sixteenth day being tuesday the twentieth of april being saturday i set sail with the resistance out of the groin with instructions to go for lisbon where i arrived the twenty fourth after and there stayed to dispatch my affairs till the ninth of may following from whence i set sail for st lucar and arrived there the eleventh day in the afternoon being saturday from whence i went by passage-boat leaving my ship at bonanza to seville and whence after three days stay there i returned to my ship the seventeenth day of the same month from st lucar i set sail the second day of june and plying it up for cape st mary's with contrary wind i put room the fifth day for kale's road from whence putting to sea again the eighth day i arrived back at the groin the nineteenth day according as my instructions directed me where going ashore to the governor and understanding the fleet to be all gone to st anderas and that the lord ambassador was already as he said embarked for england i put to sea again presently directing my course for england the twenty-third day i made the start and the twenty-sixth day of june being wednesday i landed at rye in the forenoon from whence i came post to my house at chatham with much rain thunder and lightning all the way where i lighted about ten of the clock at night in the midst of july after my return home i let out my ship the resistance to merchants for a voyage into the straits by the month one mr burgess going master and my friend william gibbons his mate and purser i docked her sheathed her and fitted her and she went from gravesend the twenty-third day of august following in the midst of october following i made a journey into hampshire to make a survey of a part of the forest of east beer being then in the occupation of the right honourable the earl of worcester of whom after my return sir robert mansell and sir john trevor bought three thousand trees at my return to london from that journey i found my eldest brother joseph pett then dwelling at limehouse very dangerously sick of the which he never recovered but departed this life the fifteenth day of november about nine of the clock in the forenoon being friday he was buried in the chancel in stepney church the eighteenth day of november in the forenoon accompanied with my good friends sir robert mansell sir henry palmer sir john trevor then principal officers of his majesty's navy and many other good friends and neighbours who after the funeral returned to my brother's house where they were all welcomed with a very great dinner and feast presently after my brother's decease it pleased my very good lord the lord high admiral to grant his warrant for my entrance into my brother's place to the effect of my letters patent notwithstanding the claim made unto it by one edward stevens of limehouse who had formerly procured a general reversion of all the master shipwright's places but by reason the fee was mistaken wherein his majesty was abused and charged with an innovation 
he could not prevail in his claim, albeit he often petitioned the lords of the council and made great friends against me. Yet it pleased God, by the noble favour of the prince my master and the lord admiral's countenance, I enjoyed my place with a general approbation, both of the state and officers, and so finished this year of 1605. I had forgotten to insert in his proper place the birth of two sons, which it pleased God were born unto me. The eldest whereof, named John, was born at Highwood Hill, in my wife's father's house, in the parish of Hendon, in Middlesex, the twenty-third day of March, 1600. The second son, named Henry, was born in my house, at Chatham, in Kent, the eighteenth of March, in Anno Domini, 1602. The twelfth of January following, I began a journey into Hampshire, into the forest of East Beer, where I spent the rest of that month in making choice of the trees were bought of the Earl of Worcester, which business performed, and my good friend David Duck undertaking the whole charge of the same in the behalf of Sir Robert Mansell and Sir John Trevor, I returned home to my house at Chatham in the beginning of February. The 21st of June succeeding, it pleased God my wife was safely delivered of our third son, Richard Pett, at my house in Chatham. The 8th day of July I took another journey into Hampshire, into Beer Forest, as well to survey how the business was ordered as to carry down money to David Duck, from whence I returned home the 14th day of the same month. The 17th day of July His Majesty the Noble King of Denmark arrived in England, against whose coming, being but only supposed some two months before, I received private directions from the Lord Admiral and some of the principal officers to have all the ships put into a comely readiness, which accordingly was performed in a decent and warlike manner, as if they had been prepared to see. But upon the news of his certain arrival they were all rigged and furnished with their ordnance, and a great preparation was made aboard the Elizabeth Jonas and the Bear for entertaining the kings, queen, prince, and all the other state and troops wherein I confess I strove extraordinarily to express my service for the honour of the kingdom, but by reason the time limited was short, and the business great, we laboured night and day to effect it, which accordingly was performed to the great honour of our sovereign king and master, and no less admiration of all strangers that were eye-witnesses of the same. The solemnity of this entertainment was performed the tenth day of August, being Sunday, at this time Sir Oliver Cromwell and other gentlemen, my good friends, were lodged at my house. Presently, after the King of Denmark was returned into his own country, order was taken by the Lords of His Majesty's Council, together with the Lord Admiral, for the dry docking of four of His Majesty's ships, Videlicet, the Ark Royal, the Victory, and the Golden Lion, and the Swiftshore, the two latter being appointed to be docked at Deptford, commended to the charge of old matthew baker the other two being ships royal appointed to woolwich and committed to my charge by reason the victory was given by the king to the prince whose servant i being it was held fit to be most proper to me which bred me no small trouble and question afterward about the beginning of september following i received warrant and directions from the principal officers of the navy for preparing the dock at Woolwich to receive the ships formerly appointed for that place, which accordingly being effected, the 8th of October ensuing, I docked the victory, and the next day after, being Thursday, I docked the ark, hastened the shutting in of the dock gates, shored them, and discharged my company the 3rd day of November following. But the 21st day of the same month I had order to press in new men, to rip and lay open the state of the ships, which, in a short time being performed, I discharged my company the 11th of December after. Towards the fine of January ensuing, I received warrant for the surveying of the forest of Alice Holt, in Hampshire, and the forest of Shotover, near Oxford. I began my journey thither from London the 27th day of the same month, and returned back to London the 2nd day of February, with a good account of my service, within short time after, warrants being granted for the number of trees to be taken in both these places i substituted my brother peter my purveyor in alice holt and one richard merritt purveyor for shotover about the fifteenth day of april sixteen o seven i received warrant for going in hand with the ships at woolwich 
whereupon I removed thither with my household presently after, and began first to work upon the ark with a small company, till provisions could be brought in to put on more workmen, which was not till the beginning of August following, at which time I began to victual all the workmen on a Monday, being the third day of the same month. The twenty-fifth day of the same month I was elected and sworn master of the company of shipwrights, and kept a solemn feast with a great number of our friends, well stored with venison, at the King's Head in New Fish Street. After my settling at Woolwich I began a curious model for the prince my master, most part whereof I wrought with my own hands, which being most fairly garnished with carving and painting, and placed in a frame arched, covered, and curtained, with crimson taffety was the tenth day of november by me presented to the lord high admiral at his lodgings at whitehall his lordship well approving of it after i had supped with his honour that night gave me commandment to carry the same to richmond where the prince my master then lay which accordingly was performed the next day after being tuesday and the eleventh day on wednesday morning being the twelfth day having acquainted sir david murray with my business and he delivering the same to his highness order was given to have the model brought and placed in a private room in the long gallery where his highness determined to see it in the afternoon but my ever honoured old lord and master unknown to me studying by all means to do me good had acquainted his majesty with this thing and the same day unlooked for by any procured his majesty to make a purposed journey from whitehall to richmond to see the same model whither he came in the afternoon about three o'clock accompanied only with the prince the lord admiral and one or two attendants his majesty was exceedingly delighted with the sight of the model and spent some time in questioning me diverse material things concerning the same and demanding whether i would build the great ship in all points like to the same for i will said his majesty compare them together when she shall be finished then the lord admiral commanded me to report to his majesty the story of the three ravens i had seen at lisbon in st vincent's church which i did as well as i could with my best expression though somewhat daunted at the first at his majesty's presence having never before this time spoken before any king it pleased his majesty to accept all things in good part and to use me very graciously and so returned back to whitehall again the same night the succeeding year brought with it many great troubles for the lord of northampton having by the instigation of some that were no great well-willers of the honourable admiral and some of the principal officers of his majesty's navy in especial favour with his lordship had procured a great and large commission from his majesty for the inquiring of all abuses and misdemeanours committed by all officers in their several places under colour of reformation and saving great sums to his majesty which he expended yearly in the maintenance of his ships which inquisition was presented with such extremity of malice as not only many were brought into great question and tossed to and fro before the commissioners at westminster to their no small charge and vexation but the government itself of that royal office was so shaken and disjointed as brought almost imminent ruin upon the whole navy and a far greater charge to his majesty in his yearly expense than was ever known before in this great inquisition it pleased god for punishment of my sins to suffer me to be grievously prosecuted and publicly arraigned as shall be in his proper place at more large described the party's informers were many whereof some were principal members of the navy and had been raised from nothing by the noble favours of the good lord admiral against whom they were contented to take party by name sir peter buck clerk of the ships thomas buck his brother underclerk to him mr matthew baker william bright principal master shipwrights to his majesty hugh merritt one of the six masters hugh lydiard clerk of the check at woolwich thomas norris and one clifton a baker sometime pursers of ships in the navy with divers others pursers boatswains gunners and carpenters these were assisted with many others as one edward stevens a shipwright and yard-keeper of limehouse 
and was in reversion for a master shipwright's place to his majesty thomas graves of limehouse shipwright and yardkeeper nicholas clay of redriff shipwright and yardkeeper george weymouth sometime a master and mariner one trankmore a shipwright with divers others that were either drawn into this business upon private ends of their own or wrought in with great hopes of future preferment End of section five.